right, I'd like to welcome everyone to the AVS eTalk on measuring your level of vacuum, a guide to gauge technology with Evan Sawyer. He's a global product manager with Kurt Lester Company. And I'm gonna go through some informational slides really quick before we let him take over the screen. Um, Hyden Analytical, we'd like to thank them for their sponsorship for online training. Uh, you can check them out at their website at the bottom of the screen here, or you can contact them if you have any questions at the email also listed below. When you logged in today, you are automatically muted. Please be sure your volume is up and that your screen is in full view. This is a one hour presentation with no scheduled breaks. Uh, in advance, you are able to uh, submit a question when you registered. Evan is gonna try to review those questions and answer as many as possible at the end of this talk if they're not already included in the content of his presentation. Uh, if you have additional questions, we ask you to use the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. You'll see a feature where you can type in questions there. Uh, we do have some disclaimers. The presentation is based on sources believed to be reliable. Uh, the AVS and author instructors disclaim any warranty or liability based on or relating to the contents of this e-talk. Authors and instructors do not endorse any products, processes, manufacturers, or suppliers, and nothing should be interpreted as such. Also, this e-talk was copied with the permission of authors, instructors of the notes who obtained copyright releases from other materials. If you would like to use anything, please make sure to contact Evan. Um, we do have additional training coming up uh, in May. ICMCTF is one of our technical conferences. They have a short course program in May with various uh, courses, as you'll see listed here. They are in person. Uh, registration is open on the ICMCTF 2022 website. Uh, you can look that up on, our, on the AVS website or at the link below. We do have an upcoming eTalk uh, we just got confirmed. It's changing the sun, quantum cutting materials to increase the efficiencies and lifetimes of silicon solar cells with E-Ray IDEL. Uh, registration will be coming soon, but we'll have information posted on our website shortly as well. Uh, if you have an idea for an AVS webinar that you'd like to see, these are half day events and we'd like to have some more topics that are of interest to you. So please contact Dave Adams. Uh, if you are interested in uh, coordinating one or having a topic you'd like to see presented. We do have some upcoming technical meetings in April, May, June, and uh, also the end of June, I was gonna say July, but we have two in June right now. Uh, these can be found on the AVS events calendar. If you'd like to check those out, registration for all of them is open. And if you're not already an AVS Platinum member, we always recommend and encourage you to join us. We have lots of things going on. We appreciate uh, your support and participation in our events. You can expand your own network, enhance your scientific and professional knowledge. Uh, we encourage leadership opportunities and you get discounts on uh, many of our events. So check it out. You can go to avs.org and you can contact Angela Klink, our AVS Member Services Administrator. At the end of today's eTalk, we have an online evaluation form. We encourage you to uh, give us that information on what you thought of today's presentation. And with that, I'm gonna bring us back to the topic of today, measuring your level of vacuum, a guide to gauge technology. Evan, I'd like to go ahead and bring you in and let you take the screen from here and begin the presentation for us. Alrighty, perfect. Let's go ahead and share that. All righty, we should be good to go. Heather, really appreciate the introduction and uh, AVS appreciate the time to present today. As you're all here, we're gonna talk about uh, a lot of different gauge technologies, something I'm, I'm super excited about. We have a lot of information to cover, so we'll go ahead and get rolling. Uh, today, um, what we're gonna start off with for the agenda is we'll talk about measuring pressure, go over uh, a, couple of few, a couple of terms um, that I typically hear in the industry and help us define a few things. We're then going to break things apart by gas dependent gauges, um, rough vacuum and high vacuum, transition to gas independent gauges, piezo and capacitance manometers. And in each section, what I'm going to try to touch on here, um, since this is an overview, we'll, we'll go into how does it work, um, talk about some general specifications, uh, some application photos and notes, and then common failures and considerations. All first things first. So measuring pressure in, in terms of overview. 
before we get into to vacuum, I, I typically like to start just with pressure in general to because it, it typically has an indication of a lot of the gauges that we use. At atmospheric pressure, we typically are looking at about 24 quintillion molecules per cc, which is typically a lot, quite a bit um, that we're looking at. If we look at um, uh, atmospheric pressure, and then we look at levels of vacuum, we correlate that to molecular density. And we can see that we have a direct correlation here. At atmospheric pressure, again, we have uh, 24 quintillion molecules. And as we start to reduce our pressure, uh, you know, we're all here because we play in some level of vacuum, um, we typically are going to reduce our molecular density. Now, by reducing our molecular density, we need to consider a, a couple of things here. Um, they're pretty important for not only gauges, but a lot of technologies we're using in vacuum. One of the things we need to take into consideration is mean free path. And that's really the distance between the molecules at any given level of a vacuum. Um, you know, for reference here at atmosphere, uh, molecules are, are pretty much bouncing off of each other in any given CC. There's a lot of energy, um, heat transfer, a lot of, of gas to gas interaction. But as we start to reduce in pressure, we're typically going to see that the distance, but the average distance between those molecules is going to um, increase. Uh, and really we're reducing molecular interaction, we're reducing heat transfer, and, and we're reducing the probability that that molecule, that gas is going to get from maybe from one end of the chamber to, to the other, uh, which tends to get pretty significant. And especially when we start talking about conductance, and this is, this is one of the big things that I see um, you know, when there are issues with gauges is conductance. And really it's just how you're connecting these gauge technologies to your vacuum system or chamber or whatever you're trying to measure the pressure of. Now, above one tour, you know, conductance, the amount of tubing in between say that your vacuum chamber and your gauge that's measuring the pressure. No, that is not a significant, uh, there's not really a lot of significance there. You know, if I have a vacuum vessel you know, connected to a roughing pump, you know, we're only getting about one tour and then I have a gauge that's, you know, six inches away or a foot away with some tubing. Yeah, there might be a difference in what the actual pressure is versus what the gauge is reading, but it's not, not gonna be too detrimental. Now that's significantly different when you're reaching levels below that, especially in the minus four or five, six and in, in ultra high vacuum. Um, you know, if you have an elbow, six inches of tubing um, that's, that's in between say an ion gauge and, and the chamber, you could be off by maybe half a decade. Um, and if you have a significant amount of, of conductance in between the chamber and say an ion gauge, it could be off by many decades. So it's just a couple of things that I, I wanna mention. We'll see some photos later on that give an indication of this, but because of the molecular density, um, you know that plays a significant role in, in some of the gauge technologies and how they work. Now, the gauge technologies here that we're looking at, you know, we're looking at gas dependent or indirect measurement. Um, we'll define those. Some of the standard terms that you've probably already heard, thermocouples, piranis, hot filament, cold cathodes. And then we'll look at independent, which is a direct form of measurement, the piezos and capacitance phenomenas. To quickly define those, gas independence is exactly what you think it is. It's these gauges are not affected by gas composition typically. All gauges are going to be cali calibrated in nitrogen. Um, but a gas independent gauge, such as a piezo or a capacitance manometer, they're going to measure the um, pressure by the direct force of the gas molecules. It's a direct type of measurement. So it doesn't matter if it's helium, argon, nitrogen, it's going to give you the true pressure, the absolute pressure. Now, gas dependent gauges, they're going to be affected by gas composition because they're using an indirect form of measurement. They're relying on a characteristic of the specific gas in the system to help with that measurement, such as thermal conductivity and ionization. And that's where if you have a gas dependent gauge, such as a Pirani, um, you know, a hot filament, a thermocouple gauge, if it isn't nitrogen or air, there's going to be a little bit of, of skewing in that measurement um, because these characteristics are different. Now, this is just a, a little graph here, but if we were to use a um, capacitance, our, um, capacitance gauge, um, a CDG, this thick red line in the middle basically says that, you know, regardless of pressure and regard, or regardless of gas type, this is going to give you the true pressure. It doesn't matter. Above one tor, one millibar-ish, um, the direct correlation to these other gases isn't linear. So measuring those pressures above, above one millibar tends to get a little tricky. 
Um, and it just, you know, you, you just have to understand that, you know, and accept that there's going to be a little um, inconvenience, a little inconsistency in the measurement if you use a gas dependent gauge, um, you know, uh, to measure some some other type of gas other than nitrogen or air. Um, you know, above above one millibar. Now below that, however, we could start to see a linear dependence. And this is where we start to hear terms like gas calibration factor. And in a lot of manuals, you'll see that, um, you know, if you wanna use helium, for instance, you might see that, well, take the measurement from your gas dependent gauge, multiply it by X, and that's what the actual pressure is. Um, there's a lot of gas calibration factors for that. So, um, you know, you could certainly do that if you need a more cost-effective option or, you know, you could just always use a capacitance speedometer to give you the absolute pressure, but we'll see some limitations with the pressure measurement with that. Another term that I, I want to define here is active versus passive. And active, simply put, is the transducer or the gauge itself has integrated electronics. Um, it has some type of electronics that translates the electrical phenomena into some type of output whether it's something that you know we can quickly measure, whether it's a um, voltage or maybe it's some type of serial communication, or even better, the integrated electronics might have an integrated display. So it then translates the voltage to a direct pressure and gives you that beautiful pressure measurement right from the display. Passive, on the other hand, means it doesn't have integrated electronics. It's a standalone gauge and it needs some type of, of reference, some type of translation uh, to, to really help us understand what's going on with that gauge. So it needs some type of remote controller uh, to really help us understand what's going on. Now, when we look at active units, sometimes it's a little bit easier and they're, they're sometimes you know, convenient realistically because they give us the typically the pressure conversion. So your output voltage to pressure equation that says if you have this output, this is what it means in terms of pressure. And we also typically will get some type of electrical pinout. And that way, if we wanna tie it into a PLC or a system or some type of uh, data acquisition system, we can fabricate a cable and we know exactly what to do. And that's a convenience for, for active gauges. There's a little bit of a difference though. And, and you know, why not just go with always active gauges? Well, some of the things consideration are passive gauges since we don't have those fancy electronics, typically passive gauges give us a higher bake out temperature. And sometimes we have to have that in vacuum to get, to, well, we always have to have to get the UHV. Um, typically, passive gauges are gonna be more resistant to radiation and magnetism, typically speaking. And a passive gauge itself typically is more cost-effective to, to repair or more cost-effective to replace, to be honest, because it's just the gauge itself. It's not the fancy electronics. Now, since you have to get a remote controller, typically the whole package up front for a passive system is more expensive. But your cost of ownership, again, repairing or replacing those passive transducers over time, typically is more cost effective. So really, you have to understand, you have to think about, well, what do I need? Do I just need to, you know, am I going to have interference from magnetism and radiation? Or do I just need to measure pressures down to the minus six or seven range where maybe an active gauge is fine? It's just all in consideration on what the application is. So let's go ahead and look at the technologies here. As you can see, there's a plethora of technologies um, and they're going to really measure in uh, uh, interesting range. So thermocouples, convection enhanced Peronis and Peronis typically measure from atmosphere down to the minus four. We'll see that some of them are actually getting a lot lower. I'll go into that a little bit later. Hot filament and cold cathodes are, you know, minus three, minus four range down to, you know, some will get you into the minus nines, some minus 11s and some of the minus 12s. Piezos will measure down to about one tor and capacitance manometers, they're kind of tricky and kind of interesting, but um, you know, they can measure various pressure ranges from atmosphere down to some of the minus six range. And we'll cover that in a little bit. Before we get into any of this though, what I always like to ask is when I'm specking something in, I always like to ask these basic questions. What's the process? What's the base pressure? What's the temperature? What is the gauge going to be exposed to internally and externally? Magnetism, radiation, high temperature. Do I have explosive gases where I have to worry about a heated filament? Um, that's typically a no-go. Um, you know, what are the process gases? Do I need to worry about corrosion, um, acidic or basic um, vapors? And I always like to ask, what accuracy do I need as well? And typically from these questions, I can, I'm pointed into what gauge I need. So we're going to start off with gas dependent gauges, specifically thermal conductivity, and we'll look at thermocouples, piranis, and convection-enhanced piranis. And we're going to see that they're typically, they, they all work very similar. So 
thermal conductivity principle for a filament style, we have constant current or variable temperature or vice versa, constant temperature or variable current. Typically, we have this filament in some variation and we're going to have molecules floating around and interacting with this filament. This filament's either gonna be a constant current and as the molecules absorb energy, there's gonna be a variable temperature. And based on that temperature differential, um, you get some type of, of pressure measurement. There's a lot of other things. I'm, I'm gonna keep things kind of simplistic because it's an overview. Um, but based on that variable temperature, um, we get some type of understanding of what, of what the pressure is um, along with a few other things. Um, but that's really what our thermocouple gauges do. On the flip side, we'll have a constant temperature. So that filament's kept at a constant, you know, 105, 150 C. And based on the uh, molecular interaction absorbing energy, the gauge is gonna require a higher or lower current to maintain that constant temperature. And that's how our Peronis or convection enhanced Peronis work. Molecules are gonna absorb energy at different rates. And that's why we have to really understand what gases are in the system or else this is gonna be skewed because we're all basing this off of being calibrated in nitrogen. Now, typically thermal conductivity uh, um, gauges with filaments, they're orientation specific. Typically, they like to be horizontal. If you have them vertical, heat rises. So molecules based on the gauge itself, they typically will go up. Um, and then you have a whole portion of the filament that's not being interacted with and there's a problem. And typically that means the measurement's gonna be skewed uh, and there's just some issues with that. To give you an example, uh, if you have a thermocouple gauge and it's vertical, now, you know, I, I just said that typically the filament likes to be horizontal. Now, with the thermocouple design, the gauge tube itself is vertical. Inside, that means the filament is horizontal. And we can see that here. Now, to give you an, an example here, this thermocouple gauge, if it's set up correctly like this, it's going to measure atmospheric pressure, let's just say around 760. If you flip this 90 degrees to where that filament is now, vertical, uh, you could get anything between 300 or 400 tor. I've done it before. Um, you know, there's some other uh, considerations based on humidity levels and temperature and things like that. But based on orientation, um, you could certainly skew this type of measurement um, from a, a gas dependent gauge measuring a rough vacuum uh, based on that orientation. It's just on, on that filament there. Um, so it's one consideration here. There's a few other, other things here. Because this is a variable temperature, um, realistically at lower pressures, because you don't have a lot of molecular interaction, the gauge is gonna be, the, the tube itself is gonna be super hot. But we have very low heat transfer because there's not a lot of molecules floating around. So you don't have to worry about the gauge really getting hot. Above you know, five torr, however, because there's so much gas, to get, uh, gas and molecular interaction, the, the filament itself is not really that hot. Um, so it's just, you know, just kind of an example of what we're looking at. We're going to see that the Pirani style and the convection enhanced Pirani style are very similar. Even though this is now a constant temperature, variable current, it's still working on the same principle where these, these gases are interacted, are interacting with this filament and absorbing ener energy at a different rate. It's just that the filament itself is at a constant temperature and there's a variable current to maintain it at that constant temperature. With Pirani gauges, you can typically change the filament style, which is going to be consideration later on. And that's one thing to note about some of the applications, uh, whether you need higher chemical resistivity or not. And very similar with the convection enhanced Pirani. This is a, a different design. Um, it's the enhanced version of the Pirani, no pun intended. Um, but there's a couple of different designs here that, that give it a little bit better flow and convection. With, with the molecules. So we can actually see um, the spectin accuracy above, I think 100 tor is, is less than 5%, um, especially if it's mounted in the correct orientation. Um, so we get increased accuracy at higher pressures just because of some tweaks um, comparative to the standard Pirani gauge. With this here, you can change the filament style um, to one other filament. It's not as versatile as the standard Pirani gauge, but again, this is tried and true, and it typically will give us, you know, some, some relatively high accuracy, which is really nice. The other consideration here is a Pirani without a filament. It's a MEMS chip. It's still going to be work, working on thermal conductivity, but because we're actually working on, on molecules diffusing through this and, and interacting with this, with this chip, we get a couple of, of key advantages. Um, and one of them being it's not orientation specific. It's also not vibration specific 
um, uh, dependent, which is beautiful. Imagine a filament, you have a high vibration because you're next to a roots blower and the filament's just vibrating back and forth. Well, you're, you're gonna get a lot of erroneous measurements because that filament is just wiggling back and forth. With a MEMS chip, however, you don't have to worry about that. It's not gonna wiggle around, it's not orientation specific. So, you know, those hard to reach places on your system or you need some, some different mounting, um, a different place to mount the gauge, this actually gives us a pretty good advantage. Now, the, the downside to this is that, you know, because of the increased surface area of that MEMS chip, um, if you have a nasty process and condensable vapors, it's gonna be easier con to contaminate this gauge. Uh, but we'll get into that in a little bit. I wanted to show this just to give you an idea of the um, conductivity here. Um, realistically speaking, uh, because we're working on different uh, thermal, co on thermal conductivity, different gases, different thermal conductivities. So we just have to understand that if it's not air and not nitrogen, um, or we'll say, you know, maybe carbon monoxide or, or typical oxygen, other gases are gonna throw off that measurement. We have to take that into consideration. Here's a few examples. Um, all makes and models, whether integrated displays, passive, active, um, you know, whether digital, just a handful of different things that we can look at. We'll get into some of the specifications and, and we'll see that Again, they're similar. Thermocouples give us the lowest measurement range or the shortest, I should say, with you know atmosphere down to about one to the minus three. Um, because the accuracy of a thermocouple gauge above one tor is relatively poor, some thermocouple gauges will only measure from one tor down to one to the minus three. Uh, and there are just different manufacturers for that. It's just that with a thermocouple gauge, typically you're not measuring at atmosphere. It's just, uh, I need to be in this range and I'm good to go. These are gas dependent and orientation specific, but since they're all metal, they're bakeable, which is kind of a beautiful thing. Remove the electronics, of course, but uh, it's passive, which is a really nice thing. Piranis with the filament, um, these typically will give a 760 or atmosphere down to about one to the minus four tor. Um, above 10 tor, it's limited. Um, the accuracy is typically limited. A again, it's just because there's just too many gas molecules floating around, uh, but we'll get about a plus plus or minus 10 to 15% accuracy. This one here, um, we'll see some of the different filaments here, but this is a really big winner for the Pirani with a, st a standard Pirani with filaments is that we can change out these, these filaments for different chemical resistivity, which is kind of nice. And very similar with the convection enhanced Pirani. This one gives us a very similar pressure range, but it gives us increased accuracy, which is a really nice thing, especially at higher pressures, which is really nice. You can change the filament on this one. Again, not as versatile as the uh, standard Pirani, but still you have that option. And then uh, uh, Pirani with a MEMS chip, um, uh, MKS has one that goes down to the minus five, uh, which is a beautiful thing, um, increasing that range by over a, by a decade on top of the uh, Pirani's and, and um, convection enhanced Pirani's. Uh, Sense4 has a gauge that actually goes down into the minus sevens uh, Pirani gauge. Uh, you could look at some of the specifications. If you look at the last decade of measurement from either one of these, however, uh, typically you're not going to have an accuracy spec. It's really for indication only, but still having these Pirani gauges go, go that low, it's, it's actually extremely impressive. And on top of that, you know, you typically are going to get an accuracy of plus or minus, you know, five, ten percent, five percent at best. Um, and once you get lower, in vacuum, you know, uh, I think the, the sense four one goes up to plus or minus 25%, but plus or minus 25% at minus five and minus six is really not a big, uh, big variation there. So a couple of things to consider. Applications, um, vacuum distillation, I typically see thermocouples for this. Um, people are switching over to some uh, capacitance manometers, but that's a different story. Um, you know, vacuum distillation, you're, you're boiling off different uh, solvents, different oils. Um, you see this a lot in, in cannabis. Um, because you have all these solvents, uh, typically thermocouple gauges are relatively cost effective to replace. So if you dirty them up, you could just toss it and replace it. You can also clean them relatively easy as well, which is a beautiful thing. Um, and that increases the, the versatility of the thermocouple gauge. And with some vacuum distillation, uh, you don't have to be as accurate. Um, you know, some of them are increasing in the accuracy, which is why I mentioned capacitance phenomenon. But realistically, if you don't need a high accuracy, thermocouple gauge is the way to go. It's, it's beautiful, it works well, and you know, you can clean it or just get a new one. Pretty nice. Um, Endpoint detection and freeze drying. This is the uh, FIRA from Digivac. This is actually really interesting for freeze drying because typically 
um, you know, for, for freeze drying, you just want to remove all the water. So what happens is, is you have a capacitance phenomenon and you have a convection gauge. And before you, you get into the freeze drying process, they're both going to measure the same amount of vacuum. Once you start to the freeze drying process and you remove water, the capacitance phenomenon is still going to measure accurate and the Pirani gauge is going to be skewed because you have a lot of water vapor. So you're going to see a very big deviation in what they measure between each other. Now, as you remove water, you're going to see that deviation decrease and they're going to start to be more aligned again. And once your Pirani gauge actually matches your capacitance manometer, you know that you've reached the endpoint detection and freeze drying because there's no more water. You're not skewing that Pirani measurement. And that way, you know that, hey, water's good. We're all, we're all good to go. So it's, it's actually a beautiful thing. You're actually kind of using the Pirani gauge in a way that you shouldn't. Um, you know, it's, it's gas dependence to, to give you an idea of, am I good or not for the process? It's, it's a really smart idea. Transformer oil pressure test. This is where I see per, uh, thermocouple gauges. People will hook up a thermocouple gauge to that, pump on it for two days, you know, go to back to the hotel, do some work. And as long as you reach, say, minus two tour-ish in that ballpark, you're good to go. You don't need super high accuracy. Um, typically, they're looking for, has water leaked into this? And if, if it has, you're not going to reach, you know, minus twos. Um, so they just want to say, am I in this range and am I good to go? Vacuum furnaces, I see another thing. If you don't have to go low in vacuum, you could see uh, different styles of convection enhanced Piranis. Uh, your vacuum four line, typically between um, four line, meaning uh, the, the roughing line between your roughing pump and your turbo pump or diffusion pump in this instance to make sure your exhaust from the high vacuum pump is, is adequate. Uh, you wanna gauge there to make sure everything's peachy and really to make sure that your um, backing pump is working correctly, because if it's not, that will certainly hurt your high vacuum pump. And we can see here that we have an ion gauge and Pirani gauge on the main chamber as well. Pirani gauges are also used in leak detectors to measure the inlet pressure. Um, you know, as the Pirani gauge on the uh, leak detector gets contaminated, it will be skewed. And that's actually a way to indicate that the uh, leak detector needs to be cleaned uh, because you're starting to see that the inlet pressure is starting to skew and you know that things are, are dirty in there. Um, so great way to detect that. But typically we don't want to get the leak detectors dirty because they're relatively expensive. And ion gauge activation. I mean, this is the, the bread and butter. Are we low enough to turn on our ion gauges? Um, we see this multi-port gauge here where you know we can manually turn on the ion gauge or we see this, um, this is a BPG 400 uh, from Infocon where the Pirani gauge and hot filament ion gauge are in the same housing. And once the Pirani gauge gets low enough, it automatically triggers the ion gauge to activate and you don't have to worry about it. It's kind of a beautiful thing as well. Some considerations, this is kind of a fun one. Well, first one that I see is contamination, the biggest thing. Um, and I'm gonna pick on vacuum furnaces just because I, I had a photo of it and it's, it's straightforward, but with vacuum furnaces, you're probably gonna be looking at some nasty outgassing from different components, all based on what you're, what you're baking out, whether it's a metal with certain um, cutting solutions and solvents, or maybe it's a CubeSat, uh, you're looking to just see if you have off-gassing from the electronics or different materials. Um, you know, in this case, it could condense and potentially erode the filaments uh, that are on the Pirani gauge. So what you can do is you can A, select a different style filament for better corrosion resistance. Um, you'll still need to understand that you need to correct for the off-gassing or just accept the fact that you're going to have some error. Uh, in this case, you might just say, hey, I just need to be in this decade and everything's fine, no big deal. Um, and that error is acceptable. If you need to be extremely accurate, however, switch over to a capacitance manometer. We'll talk about that in a little bit, um, but those are going to be um, potentially heated. Uh, super high accuracy, and you don't have to worry about gas composition. With the filaments here, I've mentioned this, but convection enhanced Piranis, you typically are going to have gold plated tungsten as a standard. You can upgrade that to platinum for better corrosion resistance. Or if you look at the typical Piranis, uh, standard's going to be tungsten. You can go to nickel, and then you can go even to ceramic if you have some really interesting material, or maybe it's some type of etching process or whatever the case is that you know, tungsten or nickel just doesn't work. This gives you greater chemical resistivity. It's going to be all dependent on the process, but this way you're not going through filaments like candy. Something to consider.
Contamination, um, you know, still, still beating on this one here. Depending on what you have contaminated the gauge with, you can pour solvent into the flange termination. Um, I, I would talk to the manufacturer about this, but for you know some of the gauges we have, thermocouple gauges, you can pour, um, and again, this is for filament style, I'll say, um, check with the manufacturer first before you do this, but um, our thermocouple gauges, for instance, if I contaminate that, I can pour solvent into the flange termination, I can gently swirl it, don't shake it like a maraca, you'll break the filament. And then you get rid of the solvent according to local and state state guidelines, power the gauge, let that heat from the filament um, um, basically vaporize the residual solvent. And if, if the solvent can dissolve whatever has condensed on that gauge, you have potentially cleaned the gauge. If you have, info, if you, if you have questions about that, please feel free to let me know. Um, I always have to say, please read the SDSs before you mix any chemicals. You certainly don't want anything to blow up. Um, but I've, I've had customers do this for quite a few gauges and it's actually returned them to working condition because they just had some standard organic material, carbon-based material on the filaments and some solvents will take care of that. You can always check the pin resistances as well. Um, on some of your standard passive gauges, especially passive gauges, like the thermocouple gauges, um, you know, down below here is a picture of a 275 or the Convectrons uh, from MKS. Um, you can look at those, check the pin resistances, and if they're within spec, you know it's good. If it's reading um, over or if the, um, uh, the resistance is slightly high, it could mean that the filaments are broken or that you have condensable vapors on them. Um, and that way you might go back to cleaning, you might just replace it depending if it's broken or not, but something to consider. Calibration is always a fun thing because uh, you can get in some trouble with this. Um, so calibration, um, you have span and your zero position um, in most of your thermocouple, uh, um, your thermocouple piranhas and confection enhanced piranhas. And this is where you might have contamination expanding that range. Or if we get into the zero position, it's, it's shifting where they think the zero or the bottom end of that measurement is. And typically with, with either of these, um, most of the convection enhanced piranhas that you have, they, within the internal electronics, you can set the atmosphere you know, the, the 760 or your barometric pressure, and you could set the zero and you can readjust that based on, you know, if you are seeing any drift. So it's, it's a really nice thing to do. Uh, you know, you can end up cleaning the gauge, you can recheck what it's measuring, and then you can reset the span in zero position and see if you can get the gauge within working conditions again. So there's a handful of things that you can do um, to check the gauge, but a lot of the gauges these days will allow you to do that, like our, our 275Is or um, you know some of the Convectrons from MKS, things like that. You can readjust this in the lab. It's actually a very easy thing to do. Last thing I look at is broken filaments. And this is just because typically you have a very large inrush of air. Someone's accidentally vented. Someone stuck this on a roots blower, a huge one, and just pumped down super quick. Uh, these filaments are very small and delicate. Um, they can handle vacuum, but if you have a significant inrush of air or someone has back purged and just shot it right into the, to the gauge, you probably are gonna have a broken filament. Most gauges these days, um, you know, they might say bad, or they, they won't just read, it might read 999 or something like that. Typically, if you have a broken filament, you have to replace the gauge, or some of them have a filament replacement kit, which can be offered as well. I'm just gonna take a sip of water here. Transitioning over to ionization gauges, we're gonna talk about hot filament and cold cathodes. So, this can get a little bit complicated and there's a lot of information here, but in the most basic sense, hot filament ion gauges or cold cathode ionization, ionization gauges work on, hence ionization. Uh, there's electrons that are emitted in some fashion from either of these. These electrons are gonna bombard um, neutral gases floating around in your system. You're gonna create an ion, a positive ion that's gonna interact with the gauge itself and you're gonna have some type of electrical phenomena that is directly related to that, get, that gas. And you're gonna get an understanding of what's going on. The, the amount of current that you see that's uh, transmitted, that's collected say on the grid or on this uh, collector here, this thin little wire in a hot filament ion gauge, the amount of current 
it's going to give you an indication of, hey, what's my pressure, which is pretty interesting. But we're all working here on interacting these electrons with neutral gases in the system to really help us make ions so we get an understanding. Because measuring you know, some type of, of current or some type of electrical output from a neutral gas is extremely difficult and, and, and just it doesn't really work. So we need to really enhance this and give us, uh, you know, we really need to do something to, so these gases will give us some information and ionizing them is the, the easiest thing to do, especially at these pressures. Now, if we just, you know, we'll, we'll take just a, a quick, quick moment to, to pinpoint both on the hot filament cold cathode separately. But again, this, this hot filament here is just that. It has a hot filament, a heated filament, whether tungsten or yttria coated iridium or thoria iridi coated iridium. And current sent through, it's going to it's basically just going to emit electrons. It's going to bombard the neutral gases, which is, which is a really nice thing. And it's going to ionize all these gas particles. They're going to collect in the, in the collector here, this thin little wire, and it's going to give us some type of current, which is a beautiful thing, and we get an idea of what the pressure is. There's a lot of other equations and things that go along with that, but that's kind of the, the basic portion of hot filament ion gauges. Now, with the cold cathode, there's no filaments to think about here. There's internal magnets, and there's an internal plasma that's usually helped um, activated or ignited by an ignition aid. And I, I kind of think of a sputtering process where we're talking about electron bombardment. But that's kind of what's going on in a cold cathode ion gauge here. So instead of the filaments emitting those electrons, you're worrying about uh, you really have an internal plasma which is kind of an interesting thing. Um, but again, we're really looking at ionizing the molecules um, and just getting some type of electrical current from those ionized molecules. Now, one thing to consider here that I, I wanna point out is that um, because the cold cathode is worried about, or you're, you're really taking into consideration an internal plasma, um, we need to take into consideration that there's an ignition status with cold cathodes. You know, back in the day, if, if you were at a low enough pressure, it could take, you know, an hour or so to, to ignite a cold cathode. And we could see here that things have really, really developed. If we're between minus two and minus five, it might take a, a second or so for this to ignite. But if you just keep a cold cathode at super, super low pressures, there's not enough gas interaction. There's not enough probability that you're going to ionize a gas to ignite or start that plasma. So it's a consideration and, and most active gauges will actually have an ignition status on if the cold cathode has ignited or not. Now, I, I say active gauges, typically your remote controllers as well will give you some type of indication of ignition status. But this is a, a screenshot from uh, a cold cathode Pirani. Uh, and it basically will tell you, hey, have I ignited? Has, is the cold cathode on or not? And I can tell you, if you have it at a very high pressure, it could be that it's just taking a while. So maybe push it back up to a, um, um, you know, maybe minus two, minus three range, let it ignite and then pump down. And that's one of the things to, to consider, uh, one of the things to consider when you're using a cold cathode. I just like to toss out a couple of photos of what these look like, just in case you, you're not familiar. There's different styles of BA or Bayard Alpert ion gauges, these nude or nude UHV or the extractor, which gets you pretty low into vacuum. And then we have um, passive cold cathodes as well down here. And we can look at active ion gauges as well. Again, some of them are come, just going to come with serial communications. Some of them have integrated displays. Um, there's just a handful of different things that are really set for whatever the application is. If, if you need an integrated display, someone makes one with an integrated display. If you need something with EtherCAT or, or Profibus or just a standard analog output, there's a manufacturer out there that has that. So I don't touch on that just because there's so many variations. Um, but again, there's a lot of variations we can look at here, um, you know, whether it's digital, serial, analog output, or even the integrated display. And if there's any questions on that, again, my, my email is going to be at the end of this presentation. So feel free to reach out to me. And, and I could always talk about drop-in replacements or things like that, where we have to match the electrical connection and the analog output or the digital output to make that true drop-in replacement.
So some of the specifications, um, you know, for standard Bayard Alpert gauges, minus two to minus nine. Um, this is pretty typical for any active ion gauges that we have. If you go to passive, say the nude UHV or even the extractor ion gauges where you need that remote controller, you get really minus three to minus 12. You get fairly low in the vacuum. And hot filament ion gauges are going to give you that plus or minus 15 to 20%. Uh, there is one exception I'll talk about in the applications, but typically you're looking at plus or minus 15 to 20%. Um, even if you have plus or minus 50%, let's take a side note here. At plus or minus 50%, if we're at five to the minus six tor, at 50%, you're at now 2.5 to the minus six to 7.5 to the minus six. You're still within that minus six range. So while plus or minus 20 or 30% that we'll see with cold cathodes, um, it seems high. When you're in that low of vacuum, it really isn't that bad. It's, it's, it's extremely considerable. One thing to note for hot filament ion gauges is the different um, design of the collector and the grid. We could see here, a little bit blurry, my apologies. Um, we have a squirrel cage design, or um, a, a squirrel, this, this a um, squirrel cage or a double helical design. And this is gonna be for your standard Bayard Alpert ion gauges. The filaments aren't as taut. Um, the design is not as uniform. And we start to get X-ray diffraction, you know, some photons being emitted, and that's gonna limit us to about the minus nine range. That's why there's a different style cage when you get into, if you have to go into the nude UHV, we can see that this is very uniform. The, the filaments are taut, the uh, squirrel cage or, or the um, basket style, excuse me, um, the basket style design is more uniform. Um, there's a larger surface area. It actually increases the probability. It, it increases your time of flight for electrons. So they're going to actually hit a molecule, which is really nice. It limits our X-ray diffraction um, and allows us to get lower in vacuum. That's why there's there's two different styles here based on the pressure you need to reach. Now talking about the hot filament ion gauges, we need to talk about the filaments real quick. We typically are gonna have yttria coated iridium and tungsten. Yttria coated iridium is typically gonna be for the, um, typically gonna be for the uh, cleaner or oxygen heavy environment, where tungsten, however, is gonna be for the halogenated material or um, you know, dirty applications. And that's just all based on chemical resistivity. Tungsten's better with, with halogens than the yttria coated iridium is. So um, you know, if you have a etch process and you need a, um, an ion gauge, tungsten filaments. If you have a clean or oxygen rich, yttria coated iridium. Cold cathodes, very similar, minus two to minus 11. You know, some will, you know, if it's active, it might keep you at the minus nine. Passive will get you into the minus 11s. No filaments to burn out here, which is really nice. There are internal magnets, so you have to worry about that if you have magnetic fields in your process. Um, but typically with the shielding these days, that's, that's not too much of a consideration. Earlier on, if you picked up a cold cathode, you had a very expensive paperclip collector. Um, and it actually, you know, you could pick up paper clips, which is kind of fun, but nowadays that does not happen. Application notes, I mean, this is, this is fairly straightforward. I mean, other than high vacuum and UHV, um, you know, pressure conditions, I do see a lot of industrial coders, like glass coders using hot filament ion gauges for the process. They go through filaments like crazy. Um, typically, I like to look at capacitance manometers for that, but you know, they don't need a high level of accuracy. So I, I do see industrial glass coders just using high filament ion gauges and they're completely okay with burning through filaments. And you do see the hot filament ion gauge um, as a calibration device. Cold cathodes are for high energy physics or synchrotrons. Um, you love the cold cathodes for this. Um, they, they've been in mass specs and SCMs, which is really nice. Um, you also can get cold cathodes in dirtier applications. You don't have filaments to burn out um, from that, that regard. You can actually scrub a cold cathode. Um, so I, I used to see that in the US, there's a lot of hot filaments in Europe, a lot of cold cathodes. I'm starting to see a general mixture of, of the two here. And for some instances, you can interchange these. But because of maybe the filaments on the hot filament, if it's you know too many condensable vapors, maybe switch over to a cold cathode. Um, or if you can't have magnets in the process, switch over to a hot filament. Um, there are some considerations we can get into. But there's a couple of photos here. Nothing too crazy. We could see this, uh, you know, the 390 MK, MKS 390 on an elbow. We see a glass gauge here. Um, you know, glass gauge is directly connected, which is nice. If you have too much conductance, again, if this were a foot away from that chamber, your, your hot filament might be measuring 
you know, minus four where your system is measuring minus six. You know, conductance is a huge thing. Typically, you'll see any type of ion gauge measuring the base pressure prior to backfilling um, the system with some type of gas for sputtering, whether it's argon or maybe you want oxygen for reactive or whatever other gas. Um, it's just a, hey, we're good. We've reached base pressure. There's no leaks. Now let's backfill with a certain gas and you're off to the races. This is really interesting because these are also used. This is MKS stable ion. This is used for calibrations, which is really nice. Uh, this will get you into the UHV range, but because of the memory chip built into this unit, um, it's one of the industry standards for, uh, for calibrations as well. So one of the questions that I had was, how do we know if our, our ion gauges are accurate? Well, you can use a reference standard to make sure that they're, they're, they're okay. Um, and we'll get into a, a couple of other considerations as well, but if you have a reference standard and it's in a clean environment, check your ion gauges against this, and you can make sure that they're reading relatively similar. Um, if we do wanna measure contamination, a lot of the gauges like this hot filament ion gauge will give you filament current and voltage, which is a really nice thing. Um, yeah, which is a really nice thing. If you measure this right when you receive the gauge, and then over time, you'll start to see the filament current and voltage increase. And that's an indication that you have some type of condensable vapors on the on the gauge itself. And that's where you maybe want to switch between the filaments or degas. Degassing is basically sending a very high current through the grid and the filaments to basically do an internal bake out of that hot filament ion gauge. Um, and basically if if it's organic material, you could probably cook that off. If it's a metallic, it's questionable at best. You can always check the pin resistances, especially with, you know, active gauges, just remove the electronics. All of this can be found in the manual. If the pins are open, that means the filament is broke and you need a new one. If the, you know, if the um, resistance is high, maybe you have, or if, it, if, it, um, if the resistance is not within spec, it could be that you have contamination and that's where you want to go back and degas, check the filament current and voltage check it again after you degas. If the filament current and voltage has decreased, that means you've removed contamination, which is a nice thing. This is a big thing. If you're going to backfill your system with gases, cool down the hot filament filaments, say that five times fast, before you do that. If you just let the gauge work as it is and you just do an inrush of air, you're gonna hurt the filaments turn off the gauge for about 10 seconds, backfill with whatever gas you're looking at and use the capacitance speedometer for your process pressure. I see this quite often with customers burning out their filaments because they don't let the gauge cool down for that 10 seconds prior to backfilling into the Militor range. This is a cold cathode internal view. This is what it looks like when it's contaminated. There's a rainbow effect. Um, typically, these are gonna measure lower in pressure if they're contaminated you can go ahead and actually remove these and a lot of them and clean them. You can physically scrub them, which is a really nice thing. You can physically scrub them. If you have copious amounts of argon with a cold cathode, you can bombard that ionization chamber and you can erode it. Um, so typically if there's copious amounts of argon, use a hot filament, um, but you can take this apart and scrub it, which is pretty cool. So we're gonna go ahead and transition into um, piezos and capacitance manometers for our last portion here. Um, so how does this work? So both of them are going to work. Uh, there's a diaphragm and based on the force of the gas, that diaphragm is going to move. And we're looking at capacitance or, or, uh, we're looking at some type of capacitance or displacement of that, of that, uh, diaphragm. And that displacement really gives us an idea of what the pressure is. There's some other mechanisms within that, um, you know, but most simplistic sense, the more pressure you have, the more that diaphragm is going to bend. Not to this extent, this is an over-exaggeration, but that gives us an idea of what the vacuum level is. Um, here's a couple of, in, this is internal of a piezo resistance gauge, um, you know, just, just as uh, kind of an idea. And this is the idea of a capacitance manometer. Again, we have, um, you know, let's just say this for the diaphragm. And as you have applied pressure to that diaphragm or, or lack thereof, now this diaphragm is actually going to bend. And that change in displacement is going to give us the idea of what the pressure is. Um, this is an absolute measurement. Um, if we look at this here, 
Um, it's a better view of the internals. Um, the capacitance manometer is going to have a reference side that's held at 10 to the minus seven with a little getter pump because there is a slight bit of outgassing, um, but you really don't have to worry about that. Um, but this is, is referencing basically it's 10 to the minus seven, um, which is lower than any capacitance manometer can get. Um, and as you have force on the diaphragm, it's going to move and you get an extremely accurate and extremely fast response of what the pressure actually is, regardless of gas composition. So it's actually a pretty beautiful thing. Here's a few examples of what we're looking at. Um, you know, whether it's a piezo, fast acting capacitance manometer, the, the typical Baritron 722 or the 626, um, just a couple of examples here. Specifications for a piezo, they measure a thousand down to one tor, uh, about 1% accuracy. It's kind of like the baby brother to a capacitance phenomenon. If you need very high accuracy, fast response time in this pressure range, and you don't have condensable vapors, piezo is the way to go, 110%, absolutely. Capacitance phenomenon gets a little bit tricky because it has different ranges that it can measure. I'll, get it, I'll show you something in a minute. They're very accurate, quarter percent down to 0.08% accuracy. These are the workhorses for any application that requires pressure control or nasty vapors. This is, this is a, a go-to just because of the chemical resistivity, accuracy and fast response time. You need to pick the right full scale range, however. The full scale range is the max value that any capacitance manometer will read. So if I say I have a thousand tour full scale, the max value is 1,000 tor, and any capacitance manometer is going to read four decades below that max value, that full scale range. So if I have 1,000 tor, it measures down to 0.1. If I have a 0.1 tor, it measures down to one to the minus five. It's just four decades below that. Questions that I get asked are, um, what, uh, what if I expose the gauge, what if I expose this, this 0.1 tor to higher than 0.1 tor? That's fine. It's just not going to measure or provide you with any measurement until you get to 0.1 tor. Um, typically, all of these are going to be okay up to atmosphere. Capacitance manometers are okay higher than that, but just from a vacuum standpoint, I always play on the safe side. All of them are good up to atmosphere. Look at the manufacturer specifications to see how high you can take it if you need to, but I always stray on the side of safety for that. Just a couple of photos here from a pressure control standpoint. Again, because of the chemical resistivity, the fast acting nature, the high accuracy from a capacitance phenomenon, this is typically what I would use to interact with a throttle valve to hinder a turbo pump's effective pumping speed or a, a mass flow controller to input the right amount of gas to control a pressure, a, a sputtering process. Uh, because it's fast acting, it, doesn't matter what gas you're flowing in, um, and it's it's chemically resistive, so it's completely okay. Sputtering, typically you'll see an ambient or a 45C heated in the sputtering range, uh, which is really nice. Um, because you have uh, an ALD processes that are elevated, you'll have a heated capacitance manometer, uh, maybe up to 150 or 200C, pending the application. I talk about how fast acting they are, but you'll have capacitance manometers that are integrated into a pressure controller, a mass flow controller to have a feedback loop for pressure control. This is an alley cap pressure controller, the BC series and the MKS 640 that both have integrated um, either a Baritron or a um, capacitance manometer sen sensing cell built into the unit. Or you can look at reference standards. Uh, another question is, um, how do I make sure all my other gauges or my capacitance manometers are measuring correctly? Use a reference standard. These are the units that will get you the highest accuracy, that 0.08% accuracy. So you can check your standard capacitance manometers that give you a quarter percent accuracy. These are the things to go to for typically when you go to a, a calibration house, you'll typically have these type of reference standards um, somewhere in the facility. For a piezo, you also might look at this for a load or atmospheric detection on a load lock. Load lock, typically you're looking at transferring some type of sample into your process chamber. Um, and because this is uh, a lower cost and it's fast acting, this will basically automate the process to say, hey, this is the true pressure, we're at atmosphere. We can automate the process and we can start to streamline production in high production tools so we can reduce the downtime so someone doesn't have to wait for another gauge to get up to atmosphere uh, and then manually start to process things. You can start to automate the process by automatically detecting 
especially if your load lock has a different gas other than nitrogen or air. Some considerations to look at, we'll, we'll, we'll finish up with this, whether to use an ambient or a heated capacitance speedometer. This is all dependent on your process. If your process is heated, you probably need a heated catman. You want your heated catman to be at a higher temperature than your process, and that way your capacitance speedometer is not a cold spot. Think of water condensing on a, on a glass. Um, you, typical, typical ones are going to be 45, 80, 100, 150, and 200 Celsius. Um, you know, depending on the process, as I mentioned before, sputtering might be ambient or 45C. ALD might be 150 internally heated or 200 Celsius to make sure it is not the cold spot because you want this gauge to give you the most accurate measurement possible. So you can't, you want to minimize any condensation in that sensing technology. Making sure you're selecting the right range. You want to make sure that, you know, for a control range, you want to make sure you're selecting the right full scale range for this. Typically, the first two decades of measurement are okay for control. The first three to three and a half decades are okay for measurement. And the last decade to half a decade is for reference. And that's just because the output voltage on a capacitance manometer gets into the millivolt range. And once you get into noise from a system and trying to skew with, with certain millivolts from, a, from the output perspective, I mean, uh, you know, if you're in the millivolt range, the single millivolt range from the output from a catman, and you have a millivolt noise from a system, you're now introducing 50% inaccuracy to what that gauge is measuring. So again, first two decades are good for control. First three to three and a half, three really for measurement. The last half a decade to decade is good for um, reference for catman. This just is a better, a better indication again. You know, first two decades good for control, first three for measurement, and you know the last decade for indication. Ambient versus heated. Again, I, I kind of mentioned this. Um, heated for nastier environments, or well, you have a heated process. Ambient, or it's not heated, or it's an ambient process. Pretty straightforward on that one. All capacitance manometers. This is one of the biggest things, and the last thing I'll end on is calibration. You always want to calibrate especially the, the, the zero drift, a capacitance manometer, you always wanna calibrate and zero that before use. Um, this is going to be affected by gravity because it's the force of the molecules on the gauge itself. So typically you want to zero this just to make sure it's, it's, it's working correctly. These are all calibrated before it leaves the factory, but if you don't zero this, you're gonna get some type of error. And typically you wanna take this half a decade below the measuring range to zero it. That's basically saying, hey, if I'm half a decade lower, I should have no output from this gauge. A lot of gauges now, a lot of capacitance manometers have a zero button that you push and it's peachy. Um, some of them have a little dial that you can, you can twist to you get zero outputs, but these are always in the manual. Orientation is always, uh, actually two other things. Orientation is always a thing as well. Uh, you could see here that based on the full scale range, if you, if you have it, if it's calibrated vertically and you transition it to horizontal, there's going to be some type of offset. So you'll need to take that in consideration and warm up as well. General ambient models need to be warmed up for 30 minutes. Heated models are anywhere between two and four hours um, for accurate measurement. You can get general measurement within you know, 10 to 30 minutes, but for true accuracy, allow it time to warm up. I'll go ahead and end with that. Um, I know we're going to have a, I haven't, I have not noticed any questions popping up in the Q and A here. Um, let me, uh, let me jump over to, I tried to answer some of the, uh, some of the questions um, that we had originally uh, when people signed up. So if you do have any questions, please go ahead um, and put those in the Q and A. Otherwise um, we'll go through here. Um, I, I have a couple of questions on drop-in replacements. Again, I, I, I won't answer those. I won't answer that here specifically. Um, what I can tell you is reach out to me um, and I can give you an indication. When you're looking at a drop in replacement, you have to worry about the electrical connection and the output voltage. Um, typically you can, you can reconfigure an electrical connection. 
Um, the output voltage is pretty much the key, whether it's output voltage or say a serial communication. Um, if you have a specific unit that you wanna talk about, um, there's been some reference in, in the questions here, reach out to me. Um, I can always spec that in and help you, help you with that one. Um, uh, okay, so uh, there's one question. We have a calibration rig at our facility um, and have been curious about zeroing. Should I zero on the rig? Um, you could zero on the rig, that's actually okay. Um, a lot of people will have a zeroing rig, especially if, a lot, if you have a lot of capacitance speedometers and you take it below, at least half a decade below the, the minimum pressure. Um, and you can zero it there, which is fine. If you can zero it on the rig, so if this is tied into a PLC, um, a lot of gauges these days will actually allow you to um, auto zero. So if you have it tied into a PLC, you can actually write code that it will auto zero. So you can tie that into your pump down process. And you could say, hey, for my 0.1 tor um, capacitance speedometer, let the pumps go down to, I don't know, minus seven and you're good to go. It'll zero and then you can backfill. Um, but yeah, we could, we could talk about that. That's, that's a really good one. Um, which gauge would you recommend for, uh, that, uh, Marcus, you, you ask about cold plasma. Um, let's, let's, uh, I, I'd ask that you, you reach out to me on that one. There's, uh, um, a couple of things we consider for, for different applications. Um, when I look at the most common failures for, for catmans, it's either a, um, that you have too much drift, uh, one, maybe you've dropped it. Um, I've had a couple people do that by accident. It's, it's, um, if it's, on a metal surface or a hard surface, that, that's, that's an issue. Um, common failures, though, these are extremely, extremely resilient. Common failures for these are you've uh, exposed it to too high of a pressure, and we're talking about a few bar of pressure. Sometimes, um, and, and as I'm saying this, I don't typically see capacitance manometers fail. I'm gonna be completely honest with you. A lot of them don't, like they're very resilient. Um, I see a lot of drift issues, and that's just because you're using uh, ambient capacitance phenomena in a heated process, and that's where you have to continually re-zero. I would suggest getting a heated version so your capacitance phenomena is not a cold spot, and I can always talk to you about the process from there. Um, I've actually heard of, of people having debris in a capacitance phenomena and those being twisted upside down and debris falling out and then using the cat man again. Um, there are baffles built into most capacitance manometers, which is a beautiful thing to help mitigate condensation, but um, that doesn't always stop it. So I'd say that overpressure is one thing you can bend or break the diaphragm or way too much drift because of condensable vapors from that regard. But um, cat mans are super resilient. I've seen these in the field for 30 years, 20 years, and still plugging and chugging because they're used appropriately. So uh, um, I, I don't, I certainly don't see these fail as much as other gauges. We'll, we'll say that for sure. Um, let me see. Um, what, one last thing. One person did ask about um, sending the slides. Uh, please reach out to me directly. Um, we have my, my email address here. Um, if you want the slides, I have no issue sending a PDF of the slide deck here. Um, I know there was a lot of information, so I can certainly send it over to you. Um, and I can always talk to you about whatever you'd like. But um, I'll end here, I know I'm two minutes over. I just wanna thank uh, AVS again um, and the team here for setting everything up and letting me talk about uh, this wonderful topic today. I really appreciate the opportunity and thank you everyone for spending, uh, spending some time with me today talking about gauges. If you have any questions again, please feel free to let me know, but otherwise I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Evan, and thank you everyone for joining us today. We really uh, had a great talk with, like you said, a lot of information. We have given Evan's email address in the chat and it's on the screen here, but I am gonna take that away and just share some closing slides before we go. If you do have additional questions, be sure to contact Evan directly. And let's see here, get my screen to share properly. All righty. So you have uh, spent time with us for one hour today measuring your level of vacuum. I Hopefully it's gone up uh, and your guide to gauge technology has improved. Thank you again to Evan.
I want to thank our sponsor, Hyden Analytical, as well. They've been sponsoring some online training. If anybody or any company is interested in doing this, you can contact me at heather at avs.org. Um, just some reminders, we have some upcoming events. All these can be found on our AVS events calendar, but we do have some different short courses coming up at our ICMCTF 2022 program in May. Uh, check it out on the conference website or our event calendar. Um, another e-talk coming up in a couple of months is Changing the Sun, Quantum Cutting Materials to Increase the Efficiencies and Lifetime of Silicon Solar Cells. So if you want another hour spent uh, learning on another topic, please check it out. Registration will be coming soon. Uh, webinars, we hope to have some more coming up uh, later this year. If you have a topic, please let us know. Uh, Dave Adams is our short course and webinar chair. He'd be happy to hear from you. Technical meetings, several coming up in the next few months. They are in person. Uh, please check them out on the AVS events calendar as well. AVS Platinum membership uh, allows you to get discounts on some of these events that we're looking at. Uh, so please check it out, expand your network, uh, help us with some leadership. If you'd like to lead in any activities that we offer, please let us know. Uh, go to the AVS website, avs.org. Talk to Angela Klink, our member services administrator. And finally, as you log out, you'll see a, a online evaluation form. If you don't happen to see it, don't worry, I will email the link to you so we can get your feedback on Evan's presentation today. Evan, again, thank you for your time and thank you everyone for joining us and hope to see you at the next AVS eTalk webinar, short course or conference. Thank you.